Hello. And today, we will be playing Honzilla Else. Hence the sunlight dance across her face. Unconsciousness seeps in gradually. It's approach hastened by a slight but firm knock on the door. As much as you don't want to wake up, you're, you're not left with much of a, of a choice. As Fred, fully dressed and willing to go already, steps inside and begins to nag you. Somehow you manage to get up to get him off your case with a yarn and a half-hearted promise that you be right down. A part of you was hoping he'd just leave and let you get some more sleep, but a towel at first set a clothes plopping into your lap and a messy ball tossed over by a winking German shepherd before he sets the door again and shatters any chances of that. With a sigh, you force yourself out of bed, yawning once more and stretching your limbs as far as they will allow, then treads off to the bedroom to finally start preparing for the day. Once you blarely step out of the bathroom, dressed and ready to go, you run face first into a very pissed off Jenny, who wordlessly grabs you by an ear and leads you downstairs, her grip not loosening even a little, despite your protests. You are unceremoniously served into a chair next to Fred in front of strawberry pancakes, this time thankfully untouched by Martha's voracious appetite for the food. Jenny, satisfied with her work, nods confidently to herself before taking up her own spot at the table, that terrifying glare already completely gone. Instead, she begins gleefully recounting the tale of the monstrous slap she delivered to Fred's ass earlier in the morning for leaving her hanging the other day in excruciating detail. In fact, you're surprised it didn't wake you up based on how Jenny is describing the noise and how hollow and terrified Fred looks during her stay, during her stories. At least the pancakes are as delicious as you had expected them to be. Once you finish with breakfast, you and Fred head out towards the mountain, much to your surprise. It only took a small amount of lying and gentle platitudes to prevent another meltdown from Jenny. In fact, she had readily bought the lie that you were going out to do more digging on this son, on two sons, in preparation for your next confrontation and eagerly volunteered herself to do some digging of her own. As you and Fred head off toward the park and Jenny bounces off eagerly into the other direction, you both agree that this might actually work out in your favor. You make your journey to the foot of the mountain, relieved that you won't, you won't have to fight with her every day. Then, as the words every day pass through your head, you realize just how miserable this experience is going to be. Getting up this early every day just to twirl up this mountain and no doubt get yelled at and beaten up by Bruce. The prospect doesn't sound very exciting, but you remind yourself that it's for Kathy and Thony. Your conviction for your sake, for their sake, supersedes the dread at least. And hey, at least a long trek up to the lodge will be a good time to go over the lessons you'll learn with Fred since the thought of asking too many questions about Bruce still unknows you. Once you make it back to the lake clearing, you spot Martha slowly meandering around the corners and surveying it with a sad look in his eyes. The moment he notices you, though, his face lights up and he dashes over, scooping you both up into his strong arms and spinning you around in a rush of joy. He's probably relieved he isn't alone with his thoughts in the damaged battlefield anymore. You briefly consider asking him why he was waiting out here 
at all if the damage upset him, but you figure out that the idea of spending just a few more moments with you and Fred is just that valuable to him. Your face heats up as that thought occurs to you and you can't help but circle warmly at Martha's cute and fascinating demeanor. Thankfully, neither of them seem to notice your bless your blushing face and once Martha sets you down, you both down giving you both light pats on the head of a course. He turns and proudly leads you both out to the lodge. You take a deep breath as you step through the heavy underbrush, underbrush into what basically amounts to Fred's, amounts to Bruce's front yard. Actually, the entire forest probably counts as his front yard now that you think about it. A nervous shiver dances up your spine now that you're back in front of, of that imposing wooden structure. Hopefully, that starts eventually. So, Martha. Martha looks back at you and tilts his head. Did everything Bruce said yesterday make sense to you? Yes, it did. Nice. I was starting to get a little worried about that since, you know. Martha starts turning his turning to face you with an even more curious look on his face. Since there were a few words I had to teach you, I was worried that some of it might have flown over your head. Wow, rude. What? How's that rude? What I'm saying is that Martha, he's basically saying you're dumb, Martha. No, 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 I'm... Martha keeps looking at you both with a puzzled expression on his face. What is dumb? See? That. That's exactly what I mean. Basically, Martha, when someone's dumb, it means they aren't very smart and don't understand something. Which is what Chad is saying you, is saying you are. Oh, I get it. So, I'm not dumb. Yes, Martha. You're not dumb. Which, for the record, isn't what I'm saying at all, Fred. Stop putting words in my mouth. Oh, I'm putting something in your mouth, all right. You put some on the soda. Ow. He acts like you just dealt a grievous, fatal wound to him, but his horrified glare crumbles into a wave of gleeful giggles after only a few moments. You shake your head and let out a sigh, turning your attention back to Martha. What I was actually trying to say is that it seems like you're a pretty damn fast learner, Martha. Am I? Yes, you are. It's actually kind of impressive. So keep it up. Martha beams with joy upon receiving your praise and nods excitedly. Okay, I will. You nod in turn, but before you can say anything further, Bruce steps out of the laws, only regarding your group briefly before turning his attention towards the training area and heading off in that direction. Looks like that's our cue, boys. Sure, let's go. After taking a deep breath and pushing down the strange mixture of anxiety and excitement, steering in your chest, you all head off after him. Once you get there, you see that Bruce has already taken up his place on the same bench as yesterday, his eyes listlessly, listlessly dancing across the clearing and only landing on you once you step in front of him and plop down onto the grass once again. Morning. Good morning, Bruce. Morning. So, do you think about what we talked about yesterday? Any doubts? Yeah. We talked a bit more about it before going to bed last night. Good. And as for doubts, I don't really have any, but I also don't have all the information. Bruce not summarily, leaning forward and taking a deep breath. Right. The monsters. Well, there's no point dancing around the truth. What you refer to as monsters were not always like that. They were, at one point, normal people, just like you or me. Your breath hitches in your throat. Of course, that thought had occurred to you, especially after seeing the growth 
but that didn't mean you hadn't hoped that was the case. Then, does that mean that every one of those trees in the grove is? Yes, there are all people who have transformed and that I have subsequently put out of their misery. The grove is merely a tradition of mine, a way to honor those unfortunate people. How? What would, what would happen to what would have to happen to a person for them to change like that? To answer to answer that, I will first need to confess to you that I left something out of our discussion yesterday. When I was explaining to you the detriments of minor exhaustion on the three aspects of your being, I said that the result of overuse of the soul is it losing its ability to process mana, correct? But yeah, well that's not wrong. It's also not the whole truth. On very rare occasions, overuse of the soul can cause damage in another way. What exactly happens is far too complex for me to explain, and I'll admit I don't even fully understand it myself, but for the sake of our discussion, simply imagine that the soul develops a whole. Though it can still bring in mana, some of that raw unfiltered mana will seep out into the rest of the system through that hole, and as you would expect, the system isn't equipped to handle that. As more and more raw mana floods your system, it gets corrupted, as with everything else I've explained, the results of this can vary on a case by case basis, but they always share a common trait. Can you guess what that is? What they all have in common? Uh, maybe all those strange bone like protrusions and the glowy ghost like hair and stuff? Yes, that's correct. Though, no. more specifically, the skull seat mask on their faces are the most consistent thing I've observed. As more and more raw mana floods the system and overloads the three aspects, causing a personal change both physically and mentally. No longer the problem remains unchecked, the worse it becomes eventually you get what you call monsters. In the later stages, the, an the anatomical changes become more severe for example, like how the tiger from the other day had massive arms but tiny legs. Sometimes it's worse than others. Take the hyena, for example. Not only did it have bone growths, but its body was deteriorating and there were even poisonous sacs connected to its claws. Like you notice though, it's not just physical alter alterations. The whole system is destabilized. The soul, for example, attempts to maintain a certain amount of model within itself, but since that model is, is constantly leaking out, the soul has to work on overdrive to keep it with it, to keep up with it, which in turn worsens the metaphorical hole in it, causing the soul to work even harder in, I think you get the picture. All that excess mana and what causes the ghostly protrusions which usually exists to make up for parts of the body that are lost as it corrupts, hair, ears, things like that. The effects of the mind should be fairly obvious as well. Massive shifts and personality, like becoming more violent or gaining a ferocious appetite. What the creature is at its core slowly crumbles away until all you're left is a, all you're left with is a mindless Monostar beast desperately searching for a way to keep up with its expon exponentially growing hunger for mana. The process is gradual, at least. At first, it's physically impossible to tell if someone's been tainted like that. The only real way to determine it's early on is if there's a drastic personality change. He pauses, staring directly into your eyes, his tone carrying a degree of implication. You blink, waiting for him to continue before 
he realized his intent and started to think then. Well, so that means that Dusan, yeah, aside from being influenced and getting a Zoma, he's most likely tainted as well. Oh no. Kathy's told me that ever since he got that big promotion several months ago, he's been acting way different. So the Dusan we know is not the actual Dusan. More than likely, no, he isn't. Then, what do we do? There has to be some way to reverse it, right? Not definitely, no. What does that mean? Bruce takes another deep breath, leaning back into his, his seat once more. As far as I'm aware, there is no definitive way to reverse the corruption unless it's caught right away. But I do have a theory on a way to potentially reverse it, as long as it's not too far along. How? What do we have to do? Even Fred seems to tweet now, since the discussion finally seems to have reached a point that even he hadn't heard before. I see that spark in your eye, Doberman. I refuse to continue until, until you calm yourself. I won't say a further word until you accept that this is purely hypothetical and not a surefire solution. I do not need you getting your hopes up then blaming me when it fails. I, I'm sorry. I'll try to temper my expectations. Good. Now, my theory is this. The body and mind are able to heal and repair themselves so long as they're provided with a good flow of healthy matter. So why should we expect the soul to be any different? And yet, despite that logic, should one of these holes form in a soul, the being is then doomed to transform into a monster. I believe that the whole is not irreparable. It's just that the soul is incapable of repairing it, either because the unfiltered mind flowing through it is too powerful for the soul to mend, mend it by itself is too focused on keeping up with the mind lost to repair it. Either way, if we follow that train of thought, I think you might be able to fix the soul by taking it over and repairing it yourself. In other words, if you drive someone, the lion for example, to complete mana exhaustion then, in the very brief moments between the body running out of mana and the person dying, infuse him with a massive amount of healthy mana. It will repair the whole and stop them from dying. Bruce closes his eyes and nods slowly. Despite his earlier warning, your heart is pounding in your chest and in your chest of adrenaline. When he opens his eyes again, that deathly serious look remains and he scans over the, the tree of you before him. Again, this is a theory, nothing more. Even if I'm completely right, the chances of this working are very, very slim. If I am misunderstanding what the problem with the soul is, it won't work. If I am assuming the period of time between minor exhaustion and death is longer than it is, it won't work. If I am overestimating your abilities, it won't work. It has to. Three pairs of eyes drift over to you as you clench your fists. I'll make it work. I'm going to start do sign if there's even a slight chance of me being able to do it without depriving the only other dead, then I'm taking that chance. Chant. Bruce scans you for a moment before letting out a long, defeated sigh, and yet you still get your hopes up. Either way, that is what you will be training to accomplish, specifically to stand up to and outlast the lion's massive reserves of chaotic wild manner. Uh, Bruce, I hate to burst your hate to burst both your and Chad's bubbles here, but I think you're skipping over an important part. Hmm? None of, none of us know how to infuse mana like that. I mean, I can do it through the body, but not directly into the soul. Chad barely understands his Zuma at all. No offense, and I don't think Martha's power would work either. Again, no offense. And since I'm assuming you plan on setting this fight, I'll, even if you know how to, that won't do us any good either. I'm aware, Severed. That's why the Doberman 
is it the only one here to train? He stands up and walks over to your group, somehow seeming taller than he's ever looked before. For your information, I do know how to do it, and you are going to learn how. It's not something you can pick up in an afternoon. In fact, I doubt you'll even be able to master it within a year's worth of training, even considering how skilled you are already. But as long as you have the ability to do it even a little, you'll still have a chance. Fred looks up at Bruce, himself now seeming smaller than ever before with a nervous scope and a nod, he finally speaks. Okay, I'll do my best. Oh, dear Separate, it will take far more than your best to succeed in this endeavor. Jeez, menacing much? <laughs> By the way, don't underestimate me. I think I already have a vague idea how to do it, maybe. I think it's still going to be exhausting as fuck, though. At first, yes. It will consume tremendous amounts of your own mana. But eventually, you'll learn how to make better use of the ambient mana around you. Fred sits his weight back and forth between his feet uncomfortably. You've never seen him look that antsy before. Hopefully, Blues doesn't push him so hard he hurts himself. Seemingly satisfied with Fred's reaction, though Bruce nods and steps back, his gaze drifting over to you. Alright, are you there? Are there any other questions? No. Not for now, no. I'm eager to get started, though. I'm curious to see what my Zoma is really capable of, and I figure you're probably my best bet to learn that. I hope that enthusiasm is more than just hollow words. I'm not going to go easy on you. Take it from me, Chad. I really do hope you prepared. I really do hope you're prepared, both physically and mentally. I, I'm ready. I'll do whatever it takes to be able to defend the people I care about, whether I like it or not. I've been way too deep with all of this mess to turn back now. Remaining, remaining ignorant to it, all is only going to bite me in the ass later. So, while I have this chance, I'm going to take it. Even if Dusan didn't show up, I still need to figure out what happened to me over the last decade, and I have a fairly solid hunch that all this craziness has something to do with, with it. Whatever you have in store for me, bring it. I see. Let's hope you don't come to regret those words, Doberman. All of this goes for you as well, Martha, so I hope you're ready. Martha nods confidently and firmly flexes his arms, seemingly quite confident about the upcoming trials, definitely more than you and Fred, that's for sure. Good. Let's not waste any time then. Stand up. The three of you nod and turn and get to your feet. First of all, the basics. As you all know, each Zoma is unique in its own way, so there's no cat's all method to training and improving. Yet, it all depends on what you're capable of and how you want to improve. Therefore, before we proceed, I'd like for you all to demonstrate to me what you are, what you are already able to do. As for the Sefford and Martha, I'm, I'm already familiar with your ability, so you both can stand by for now. Doberman, tell me what you can do. Sure. You take a deep breath. Then thrust your fist forward, summoning your magic hand, your Zoba. You begin by demonstrating how the hand mimics your motions perfectly, following your arm as you move and twist it. Bruce pays close attention to your motions, watching by a surprising amount of curiosity. Next, you show off your ability to extend it and retract it, glancing over at Martha as you do so and seeing a sparkle in his eyes as he watches you like a proud parent. That's about all you can show off without any props, though. So after looking around, you point over your shoulder at the makeshift training dummies nearby. Is it okay if I use those? Yes, that's why they're there. Go ahead. All right, thanks. You walk over to the closest one, grabbing onto it with your Zoma before leaning back far enough to demonstrate that you're able to hold yourself up with it, even from afar. <clears throat> You pull yourself back up by retracting your Zoma, then close 
the distance to the dummy before hand, before standing several feet away. Lastly, you throw a quick punch, nailing the dummy square in the middle of its face and causing it to flop backwards momentarily before flicking back up. Satisfied that you're exhausted with your minimal list of abilities, you give your hand a sink, dismissing your zone before turning back to Bruce, only to see him staring at you with a raised eyebrow. Well, um, ta-da, I guess. You look so disappointed. Letting out alongside, he crosses his arms before bringing in a, a hand up to his forehead and gently rubbing it. Well, you are only now learning about your Zoma. It's expected that you wouldn't know how to do very much with it. So you can create and dismiss an ethro copy of your hand at will. As I expected, your Zoma is purely based on the body. Come back over here and summon it again for me. Sure. Run back to him, throwing punts off to the side before you approach the tiger and not accidentally hit him with your ghost hand before finally holding it carefully in front of him once you come to a stop. Bruce takes a close look at it, analyzing it intensely for a few moments before grabbing it with his own hand and squeezing it tightly. Do you feel this? Kinda, it's like a vague sensation. He nods to himself, then releases it and takes a step back. Hold it firmly. Before you even have a chance to react, Bruce's leg is high above the ground, and the air around you charges with static that tingles your fur, then the echoes of a loud clap of thunder roar throughout the surrounding trees. Whoa! You seal your eyes from the blinding light. The blending flash of light terrified that you're about to be in a tremendous amount of pain, and yet nothing. When you look back up at the tiger, you can barely manage to see your zone split neatly down the middle, just before it completely fades away into nothingness. What the hell was that? Ignoring you, he lowers his foot back to the ground, then gives it a shake before letting it come to rest, causing small sparks and arcs and blue electricity to dance away from his leg, almost as if he shook them off of his fur. Did you feel that? I, I felt, I felt it, but it didn't really hurt. Thankfully, was going, was going that hard really necessary? Though, he continues to annoy you, crossing his arms once again and breaking a hand out to his chin. All right, so it is directly attached to you. Your emotions can be controlled through it. But damage to it doesn't affect you, at least not beyond wasting the mana it took to summon it in the first place. Jeez, I know I say I trust you, but come on. Depending on how you see it, it's probably a good thing that you can that you can't feel pain through it, though. That might be indi indicative of a lack of synergy. It's possible that fat will change with training. I've also noticed that you always use a specific gesture to summon it every time. Is that is that necessary or do you just do that out of familiarity? Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, the first time it appeared, I just lunged to grab onto something that was falling far away from me and there, was, and there it was. That's how I've always summoned it ever since. Hmm. Now that I have a good idea of what you're currently capable of, we're going to start by having you master those skills first before you try adding any new capabilities to it. So, let me summarize what I believe you are currently able to do and what your limits are so we're all on the same pace. Then, we can work on breaking those limits. Sure. Fred and Martha are still patiently waiting off to the side, though, their attention is focused on you and Bruce, seemingly just as curious as you are about where this is going. Since your Zoma is based on the body, the hand is simply a projection of your raw hand made of made out of mana and it's still indirectly linked to your physical form. Naturally, each time you summon it, it consumes mana from within your body, and whenever you dismiss it, that mana just vanishes. Although it's fairly 
small and you can't do very much with it so that mana cost is likely very very low but it's also possible that there's an initial cost to summon it followed by continuous drain and to maintain it we need to figure out whether that's the case additionally we'll also need to figure out other ways to summon it not just by throwing a punch alongside that will build up its resilience so it's not so easy to shatter. If a simple kick was enough to break it, do you run the risk of an enemy taking advantage of its fragility and effectively disabling your ability to fight? A simple kick? You call down the might of friggin' Thor on it. Well, maybe he's just innately extra. That's a worrying thought. Lastly, I think we should work on the distance, both in terms of summoning it and sitting it further away and drawing it in close enough that it lines up with your real hand so it can potentially act like a sort of gauntlet. Oh, that would be cool. Keep in mind that this is all what your Zoma can do at this, at its most basic level. Like, it, like with how the Sephiroth went from being barely able to grow a sprout to raising an entire forest, he has plenty of room to grow and improve. <laughs> I'm also an AI, Martha. Martha nods and applauds happily. Just don't make me do that again. I can barely get out of bed for like a week afterwards. Distractions aside, that is what you're going to be working on for now. Focus solely on improving those things and don't worry about anything else. We'll think about implementing them in, battle, in combat at a later time. Sounds like a lot of work getting cold feet already no just that's a lot of that's a lot to think about even without thinking about using them in combat don't worry chat it takes time it's not like i reached the level i'm at after like two years and then stayed the same ever since it's going to take a long time to get it all down and a lot of effort too anyway before we begin and in, in earnest do you have any questions doberman no, not at all. Just thank you again. Hmm. Then let's begin. Martha Sapper, once I've gotten the Doberman started on training, I will return to get you both started as well. Martha nods enthusiastically, and Fred gives a thumbs up as much. Bruce merely rolls his eyes before walking to the opposite direction, leading you over to your own spot some distance away. All right, pay attention, since I'm only going to go over your resume once. Don't make me regret taking this time to train you. Oh boy, there goes Bruce being Bruce. You let out a short sigh before nodding firmly. I'm ready. To begin, we're going to first measure your Zoma's cost, bring it out. You nod and throw a punch, summoning your hand. As you do, Bruce pulls a small device out of his pocket. Okay, now what? Bruce presses a button on it, and you realize that you recognize the safe from P.E. back in school. Must be a stopwatch. Now, just keep it out. That's it? That's it. I'm going to test to see how long you can cast, you can last with it summoned. I'll come back to check on you later. Feel free to take a seat or wander around, but don't go too far. Most importantly, though, do not miss... Do not dismiss it. If you dismiss it by accident, we'll have to start over. That's it. He rolls his eyes, pocketing the timer once again as he turns away towards Fred and Martha. I'll be back tonight. T tonight? He pauses, staring back at you, over his shoulder with a dismissive huff. That is, if you can last that long. He continues walking away, leaving you by your lonesome. You let out a sigh and flop down on under the grass, making sure to hold your hand up so that it doesn't accidentally punch the ground or something. Jeez, this is totally gonna suck. And so you're trying to better understand your Zoma begins. Not exactly a flashy start. By the end of that first day, you find yourself somehow jealous of 
the looks of exhaustion painted across the faces of the other three men. Despite his exhaustion, Fred still rushes over to you once Bruce lets him go to check up on you and make sure you're not dying or something. Before he finishes his checkup, Bruce confirms that your Zoma does seem to have some does seem to have a summon cost only. This actually takes you off a bit. You could have figured that out yourself and came to that conclusion hours ago, but you thought that maybe you were lucky and just had a massive amount of reserve mana. No such luck. Instead, you had to watch other people training, bored out of your mind, your massive hand rapidly growing mundane as it hovered in front of you, almost tauntingly. They were so far away that you couldn't really talk to them, and hell, it didn't even get anything to eat. Probably could have asked, but whenever you considered it, it would probably it would worry the laps and your focus would dismiss your hand. And you figured that out of all the absolute bottom of the barrel choices present to you today, starting all over was the worst of all. Though frankly, you probably would have been fine. You fought with it before, so why would just getting up cause a problem? But better safe than sorry, right? Nah, you were just overthinking it. Afterwards, Bruce gives Martha permission to guide you guys down the mountain since it had gotten late. Thankfully, no more monsters attack, and you part ways after saying your goodbyes with Martha, heading back up the mountain, and you guys heading back to the cafe. Jenny, the absolute saint that she is, sometimes had gotten some food for you, which you both eagerly devoured before heading upstairs to get some well-deserved rest. Day two of training. Your morning routine today is much the same as yesterday, though. This time it's Fred who is difficult to rouse from slumber. To preview the state you no doubt will perpetually also be in soon enough. Doesn't seem very exciting, to say the least. Martha meets you only a short distance into the forest as well, which is a welcome sight. At the greeting him, you all climb the mountain together. Once you make it back out to the training grounds, you find Bruce already there waiting for you, seemingly meditating before your arrival. Wordlessly, you all split up to your designated areas and Bruce begins to his feet to follow you to yours. All right, today we're going to test your limits. Summon it. You follow his command, summoning your Zoma with a punch and holding it out in front of you. Now dismiss it. Okay. You do as he says and dismiss your hand. All right, now just keep doing that until you start to feel fatigued. Wait, what? You heard me. The fatigue will be a sign that you're running out of mana, which means it's time to stop. I'll be close by and pay attention, since I need to count how many times you do it. So don't worry about hurting yourself or anything like that. Without much room to argue, you set the summoning and dismissing your Zoma. For a good while, you follow Bruce's instructions to the letter. You throw a punch in your polygonal hand, made, a, made of mana appears, then you miss, dismiss it. Again and again and again. Eventually, after the 13th repetition or so, you encounter an unforeseen issue. Your arm is crampling like mad, forcing you to wince as you keep repeating the motion. Bruce notices this and tells you to try with your other arm and circle back and forth as they start to cramp up. After a while, you've completely lost count and your arms are starting to feel like they're made of lead. After dismissing your hand once again, before you can throw another punch, you almost kneel, you almost kill over involuntarily, supporting yourself on your knees as you pants, sweating, pouring from your face. This is what mana exhaustion feels like? God, it's miserable. I feel like I can't even move. Hmm. 632 times, not bad. Your ears twitch as, as Bruce speaks, and you manage to summon up the energy to turn your head towards him, watching him approach. He goes on to explain that 
while that might seem like a lot, it's only because you, you're, you're using your Zoma at its most basic level, meaning its, its cost is excessively low. Eventually, as you develop your, your Zoma and it gains more abilities, its minor cost will increase in tandem. At least you'll never have to do that tedious crap again. Day 3 of training. Today, you're going to keep doing what you did yesterday. What? Why? This time, we're going to break your limits a bit, and in order to do that, you need to push past the fatigue. So go on and exhaust yourself again. Let me know once you start to feel it, and I'll work with you on the next steps. Can I at least get something to eat in between? No. Why not? Because. Without another word, he turns and heads back towards Martha and Fred, who you notice look like night and day from here. Martha is excited and beaming, whereas Fred looks like he's about to be stabbed to death in a back alley. Can I at least know why? Bruce stops briefly to respond to you. No. Then he continues on. Damn it. You take a moment to stretch and lever your arms up, hopefully to stave off some of the soreness in advance. Then you get to work. By the time the sun starts to set, you can feel that now familiar, awful feeling setting in again. B Bruce, the big tiger's ear twitches and he turns away from Fred into your direction. He nods and turns back to Fred momentarily, saying something inaudible to him before making his way over towards you. You're already feeling it, Doberman. Y yeah. My arms are numb and I feel a little nauseous. Good. What do you mean, good? Keep at it a little longer while I'm here. But I'm just do a Doberman. You take a deep breath, wipe sweat away from your forehead as you force your body back into position. Then resume the summoning and dismissing process as best you can and while all while Bruce trades a steady eye on you. Sefford. You jump a bit from Bruce's sudden south, but then you keep going, worried that if you stop, you won't be able to start again. Though you do notice Fred slowly reacting to the call, then hobbling over to you, his exhaustion easily visible in everything from his expression to his gait. You're still not entirely sure what Bruce is even doing with him. He refuses to tell you anything either, though it's blatantly apparent it's exhausting him. So you don't worry, so you don't want to pry too much. And the day's no different. He looks like a walking corpse, but you barely notice. Though, being Fred, he still manages to flash your tired smile as he lines up next to Bruce. All right, separate. It's time for you to put everything I've taught you into practice. You can barely even register him speaking with how tired you are. Every fiber of your being is heavy with aches. It's even worse than how you felt after that test you had to do back in P.E. Doberman, stop for a second. I don't even question him. You immediately seize all movement as he commands you, followed quickly by you, by you collapsing forwards and backwards into the grass, your lungs, heavy, your lungs heaving as they desperately suck in air. Fred carefully kneels down next to you, leaning over you a bit, and holding his hand out. Now, watch it. Here goes. Wait, what? What are you gonna do? Don't worry about it. Just, uh, don't freak out after I'm done, okay? <laughs> Alright, separate. Remember to take your time and breathe. You peer up at both other men. Through a single strained eye, the curiosity and confusion registering enough of Bruce for him to finally give you some answers. 
dopamine since you are working on spending your mind of reserves and the separate is learning how to better manipulate mind we're going to be working together every now and then. The separate is going to attempt to share his mind with you, which you which will simultaneously help him get better at it and help you continue training even once you run out. Though even when mastered is still an immensely draining and imperfect process so do, so do not be alarmed by the separate's resulting exhaustion. I won't let either of you hurt yourselves by overexerting your minor reserves. Fred nods and, and while still wearing that tired smile, holds his hands over your chest with a very small amount of distance in between. He closes his eyes, taking a deep breath in. His whole body tightens, causing dimly glowing light to form beneath his palms. It looks like it looks similar to when he healed your foot the other day, but much denser and more noticeable. It's warm and tingles your chest where it rests. You involuntarily stutter from the sensation. Whoa. Fred winces a bit. His muscles tighten further and the sensation deepens. and begins to seep more noticeably into your very being coursing through your body after only a few seconds your breathing begins to slow and feeling returns to your arms. You watch on in amusement in amazement enthralled by this feeling, but suddenly the glow vanishes and before you even have a chance to react, Fred flops forward onto you completely limp. Friend You sit up quickly, barely even acknowledging how impossible such a Simple tests to have been in your previous state. Then you support your unconscious friend and stare down at him with deep worry. Don't worry, Doberman. That is normal and expected. Like I said a moment ago, the process is imperfect, especially when you are unfamiliar with the technique. The ratio of mana consumed to, to impart it is wildly unoptimized, so it consumes a massive amount. Though, I am quite stopped by the progress he's making. You may just have a chance after all. In any case, he will likely be out for a while. Which is why, as both practice for Marthic and a soul of trust in his independence, I'm going to allow him to help you both get home, since he seems to already know where you, where you live. So, he'll be alright? Yes. I made sure he ate properly beforehand. He may be unconscious, but there will be no lasting damage. Bruce uses his whiskers to lift Fred up by his shirt, his body distressingly limp like a puppet. You do your best to trust, to trust in Bruce's words that he'll be fine and get back to your feet as well. Now that you've gotten a second win, I'd like for you to continue. Under normal circumstances, you will fall unconscious before using a deadly amount of mana like the Sepper did, so we're going to have have you do that as well. And don't worry, there's no real, there's no real risk to pushing yourself like this. This is a mana rich environment, and so long as you exhaust yourself here, your body will be able to regulate the mana in which and you and you without a problem. So keep going until you're close to fatigue again. You nod with a small sigh. As you look back up, you see Mothuk trudging over with an angry spark in his eye. He snatches Fred from Bruce's whiskers, then cradles him in a far more comfortable and less disturbing way. Annoyed by Bruce's lack of tact or respect while grabbing Fred, Mothuk uses his free hands to back the whiskers away while glaring at them. They move back a bit, seeming to watch Martha for a moment before fully retracting backwards to Bruce. I was about to hand him over to you anyway, Martha. Martha gently and carefully pats Fred on the back while glaring at Bruce. With no words that sings, at least as far as you could tell, the moth simply, no simply turns and walks away from Bruce in a huff with his arms crossed. <sighs> Bruce shakes his head slowly before returning his attention to you. All right, you can begin, Doberman. With that, Bruce makes his way back to the bench near the edge of the training area, sitting down on it and staring at you as you resume your repetitions. 
Man, this sucks. I knew it was going to be hard, but now I have to desperately knock myself unconscious. I suppose I should at least be grateful for this body. If I had still been skinny, I feel like I would have turned to jelly by now. <sighs> It'll be worth it in the end, Chan. Days pass as you repeat that process over and over again. You wear yourself out, Fred knocks himself out, giving you mana, and then you knock yourself out. As grim as that sounds, though, you feel like you're actually, actually coming to more thoroughly understand what your limits are. Mazat seemed to have the easiest time of it, with his training seemingly being only to carry you and Fred back home at the end of each day, though he does have to make all three of you invisible on the way back, so you suppose that still counts. On the fifth day, you and Fred and Jenny were able to go see Thony again, thanks to Mr. Lorenzo's generosity. While there, Thony reports that he passed everything you had said on to Kathy and promised on her behalf that they will hold on for a few more days and that they trust that whatever you're doing will be worth it. That being said, Kathy can only wait for so long. She can't risk keeping Thony about Dusan and the state he's in, which you don't blame her for, for at all. But at the same time, with running away, if it accomplish anything, there's no doubt that Dusan will just follow them anyway and that will just make the situation worse for everyone. It's a tough decision to make, but ultimately, you ask Thony to tell Kathy to hang in there and that you're going to keep them safe no matter what. At Thony's innocent request to, you make a promise and after a hug, he scampers off the class. Leaving you filled with determination, you keep going. Seventh day of training. After the last several days, I hope that you know how, I hope that you know have a good grasp of your Zoma's cost and how much of that cost you can tolerate. Am I correct? Yeah, I think I got a pretty good idea of it. Good. It may seem simple, but being able to tell how much the use of your Zoma affects you is one of the most fundamental parts of using one. That's my goal here, to provide you with a basic foundation for your build upon on your for you to build upon on your own time when you're training by yourself. Got it. Since you've got a good grasp on the cost in your limits, we're finally going to move on to actually improving it, which is why I've invited Martha to join us. It has come to my attention that he was the one who actually helped you figure out how to send and retract your hand. Is that true? Yeah, actually. I'm still kind of reeling from it. It's not every day a big mock guy readily starts feeling yeah, actually, I'm still kind of reeling from it. It's not every day a big mock guy readily starts fiddling with your powers out of nowhere. Especially considering I've only really, I've only ever really seen bug people on TV and stuff before. How exactly? Did you do all that stuff with my Zoma anyway, Martha? Um, I, if I had to guess, it's because his mind-based Zoma allows him to be more intimately aware of mana fluctuations. People with Zomas are easy to spot if you can sense mana, since they have a lot more of it. Also, thanks to his Zoma, in particular, he's quite good at picking up on and understanding creatures in the most feelings and emotions which likely explains why he warmed up to you so fast and was so eager to help. Oh yeah, that's exactly it. I could tell there was a lot of mana flowing through your arm and all it took was a little bit of poking to make your Zoma pop out. After that, I just sort of guessed that you could extend and retract it and that it would be useful at that moment. I'm glad I was right. <laughs> yeah, same here. I'm also pretty glad you and I can talk so clearly now, 
Feels like just yesterday I could only hear a word or two. Uh, um, his face flushes red and he pushes his fingers together. It, yeah, I feel pretty much comfortable around you now. He grin wide, giving him a firm, encouraging pat on the shoulder. Same here, buddy. Happy to have you along on this crazy ride. Martha's blush deepens and he covers his face completely with all of his hands. The tiger reaches over and gives the moth a gentle pat on the head with his whistles. You are quite the fast learner, aren't you? Martha only answers with a sigh and bears wine, causing you to laugh some more before the tiger clears his throat to draw your attention back to him. Anyway, to get back on topic, that is precisely why, that is precisely what I'm going to have you both do. Martha will learn how to better sense and process mana while helping you learn how to extend and retract your hand with your mind. Now, I know the first time you tried this, it didn't go well, but you didn't have much time. And beyond that, I've also given him some tips that should help you out as well. I'm sure it'll go faster, it'll go better this time. Martha finally recovering from his sinus, applies with his upper hands and jumps a little bit in excitement clearly eager to work with you. His enthusiasm remains dangerously infectious. Cool, I'm looking forward to it, Martha. All right, let's get to it then. Martha nods, stepping closer to you and hold up a finger. I'm pretty sure a major hurdle that first time was the communication barrier. We had just met, so I couldn't really talk to you at all, but things will be different now. I envy that optimism, but I still feel like it's going to take some time for me to understand how you feel, don't worry. But just like how we learn to talk with signs and then gradually like this, it'll just take time and practice. I'm not the only one who learns fast since we don't need to use signs at all anymore now. Oh, that's fair. Though I met, I actually had a lot of fun communicating with, with signs and stuff. <laughs> you too, but progress is progress, so let's start making some. He glances over at Bruce briefly after saying that, and he can't help but gaze, but follow his gaze as Tiger's mouth was open as if interrupted right white as he was about to speak. The interruption seems to have satisfied him, though as his and his expression relaxes a bit. To begin, can you please summon your Zoma? You immediately comply and throw a punch in the air, summoning it as requested. Good. Now, as you probably figured out by now, your zone is an extension of your own body, so it should follow the commands your brain gives your body instead of you needing to use your body to control it. Basically, the same way you move your legs, arms, muscles, whatever, should naturally also work with your zoma. Make sense? I think so, yeah. Good. So in order to do that, we just need to figure out a way for you to gain, for you to get your brain to perceive it as a part of you, just like it does your real hands. Luckily for you, I've been told of a method to trick your mind to thinking that something that is a part of you is. Mm-hmm. It's something called multisensory perception and integration, which is basically a fancy way of saying we need to manipulate certain stimuli that make it so your brain processes those stimuli and add it on your zoma the same way it would a direct touch. Multisensor what? Who taught you that, Martha? Books. Mr. Bruce taught me how to read. Oh, neat. But why does he have books that teach that kind of stuff just lying around? What a weird guy. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the ideal outcome is that we trick your brain to registering your zone as part of you and then reverse the process so you can apply stimulation to it with your mind. In that case, we, you would stand and retract it with, without actually moving your arm. It will be, it will by no means be an easy task. 
but it is definitely possible most every Zoma user needs to go through similar to, go through training similar to this to enhance their infinity with their own power. In this particular case we can almost consider this training more common than most since people live their whole lives familiar with their whole body and they lose a part of it they'll need to adjust to that change. This is roughly the same thing though in reverse and instead you'll be adding a limb to your body but the same thought process still applies. Yeah, so are you ready to get started? Yeah, I trust you mother, so let's do it. Somehow this round of training ended up being the worst so far, solely because of how draining it was, not physically but mentally. It only took a few hours of your first day for your head to start throbbing from how hard you had the concentrating the task at hand. Initially, all you did were some simple mind games with a fake hand to familiarize with, to familiarize you with the concept. After tickling both your real hand and a fake one, Mother Head conjured with his mana. The moth would smash the fake one with all his might for a split second. He would feel the pain in the real one. The brain is scary sometimes. After experimenting with that subject for a while, the next step for you was to pull your zoma in close enough that covered your hand which was a challenge in of itself surprisingly. Thankfully you did eventually get it though the process of resulting sensation felt akin to forcing your hand into a glove that was two sizes too small even if visually, visually your hand could comfortably fit inside. And so from that moment your objective was to keep your zoma like that for as long as possible without interruption, the intent being to acclimate yourself to your Zoma, being a part of your everyday life, a direct part of your true physical form. Of course, such a task would pose a serious problem if anybody, especially Jenny, saw your hand suddenly polygonal and glowing at the time, and glowing all the time. Thankfully, Bruce and Martha devised a solution for that. A blue fingerless glove perfectly fitted to your right hand. Actually, it was originally more of a mitten, but once you slipped it over your zone, it struck down, taking the visits of the glowing polygon hand with it until only the fingertips glove remained. Apparently infused with some of Martha's mana, it would act as a weak, illusory barrier around your hand, so any outside observer, observers would only see the fingerless glove, though if you squint it and focus on it for a bit, you could still tell it's a mitten. It came as a surprise scene as you thought Martha needed to be present for Zoma to work. It really put in perspective how capable the big guy was and how powerful Zoma could be, even what you assumed to be its infancy like yours was. Though, with, though Bruce did explain that Martha's training so far had been almost entirely to improve his ability to support you and Fred in your training since he was strictly forbidden by Bruce to get involved with the fight. Now that the idea seemed to bother him any in fact he seemed quite excited to see excited to be able to help with whatever way he can. The tiger passed this information on with a touch of resentment in his tone, which you later figured out was because it wasn't his idea to begin with. He wanted Martha to train on more important things, but Martha had already made up his mind that, that he was going to help you guys out one way or another. After a bit of prodding and assistance, Bruce eventually said that you were the first friends Martha had ever had besides Bruce, so that's why Martha wanted to help. That and the fact that the mom wanted to show your gratitude for all the help you and Fred have provided so far. That's all you were able to get out of him, which was honestly a chore by itself, but almost tauntingly he assured you there was far more to it than that, and then resumed your training without another word. Now a seemingly infinite tidal wave of questions still swarms through your mind about the two mysterious mountain dwellers with each vague and half answer you get only raising even more questions. But you gradually coming to terms with the fact that asking them is a waste of time, at least for now. 
Eventually, the answers will come. You just need to give it some time. The days come and go, and all the while, your Zoma encasts your hand, and the sour doing meals while you sleep, while you're climbing the mountain to train, doing your training, and on your, on your way back down, always on. It's become a routine. Wake up, breakfast, climb the mountain, train, go back down, get thrown to a late by Fred to wash off Mother's scent, dinner, sleep, all of your minor active. You're decidedly grateful it doesn't have a continuous cause. The very thought of how exhausted that would be exhausts you. But you remain diligent. Some days you come close to losing it, waking up the f- Wake it up to it, fading away, but a quick punch always rectifies that before it fully disappears. After a few days, Bruce lightens up on Fred since the cumulative strain was noticeably started to get to the poor shepherd. Fred had complained at first, but ultimately agreed to it. On the plus side, it means he can now help you down the mountain each day himself instead of having Martha do it. Sure, the big moth was disappointed and had insisted it was fine, but you still get, but you still felt guilty relegating him to being a pack mule so often. Plus, it's nice to finally get to see those dark circles on the foot's eyes start to fade away. And so the cycle continued until one exhausting night, where even Bruce was too drained to put up a fight. When Martha asked him if he could go down the mountain with you and spend the night, the tiger had even agreed to let you show up late the next day. You would have celebrated more if you weren't so tired in your collective defense. All of you had earned a break. Even Martha, a seemingly balanced source of enthusiasm and energy, was showing his fatigue. The rest of the night was a blur. You know for a fact, however, that you eventually made it to bed, and you must have passed out quickly. In the middle of the night, you blurrily wake up and find yourself staring at your bare white hand. You stare at it, you stare at it with half-lidded, blurry eyes. You have barely enough consciousness thought. You have barely enough conscious thought to realize that something is wrong here, but not what specifically. Deciding to deal with it. The following morning, you absentmindedly roll your fingers in as your eyes close up. Again, a blue glow enshrouds that hand once more. Trying to deal with it, the following morning, you absentmindedly Roll your fingers in as your eyes close up again, a dim blue light, a dim blue glow enshrouds that hand once more. You nestle up against Fred, getting comfortable again, and let yourself begin to drift off the drift back off to sleep. Your eyes snap wide open, adrenaline suddenly fur- furiously pumping through your body and making you feel more awake than you felt in days. You stare at your right hand as if it's some alien monster briefly wondering if that's what his dream. So you dismiss your zomba, staring intensely at your hand as the glow fades and then like flipping a switch in your head. It comes right back. You rock up rock it upwards in bed, still staring down at your hand with a sparkle in your eye. You did it. You actually did it. After all this time keeping your zomba on for hours and hours and hours now start, you finally called on it without needing to move your arm at all, much less throw a punch. Martha, who had managed to somehow squeeze in behind Fred, peers over the separate shoulders to watch you for a moment as you flicker your Zoma on and off your hand with utter childlike glee before softly applauding your accomplishment. Then he promptly passes it, passes right back out. Now you think about it, how in the hell did you, Fred, and a muscular moth like him manage to fit on such a small mattress anyway? Carefully, clearly, you were all squished super close together. Even then, Martha was hanging halfway off the side.
Okay, so um, Chad, I mean, um, yeah, Chad was able to make his hand appear without him trying, having to um, do any physical work, like pulling it and, you know, like how he uses his arm to, to make it appear. Instead, he, he was able to make it appear on his own without any physical work. He's able to use it mentally. And it was only after many exhausting days of him, you know, just having his um, arm, arm out for hours, many hours, that he was able to make it work. So another half was exhausted from him and Fred and Martha with their training as well. You know, Bruce, he's still really curt with Chad, but at least he's teaching him the lessons. And he at least is willing to take questions from Chad and Fred and Martha. He seems to treat Martha the best. And he treats Chad the worst and Fred's like in the middle, so... Saying, um, we got to see Thorny again, and and um, Chad told him to hang in there a little longer. And about Dusan, um, we learned that like damages like the Zoma can affect your personality. It can change it to something that makes you so somebody who's completely different from who you were. It can make it can corrupt your personality. Which is what happened to Dusan. That's not the real Dusan that we've been seeing. Okay, and I think Chad will end up, well, Chad's gonna end up having to fight Dusan, and I think, I don't know, if, if it was possible, he can try to get the, um, you know, get Dusan back to his normal self instead of the alternative, which is to have Kathy and Tony separate from him. I mean, if he's not able to. get Dusan back to normal then which is a um there was there's a low chance that happening that he might have to try to get Thorny and Kathy to separate from him and move elsewhere. But again, you know, Dusan's a powerful man and he has resources where he can catch up with both Kathy and do Kathy um Thorny to see Martha speak more now so he's able to speak with complex sentences now and um, be more detailed in what he's trying to tell Chad and he was very knowledgeable about the Zoma power and with him being able to speak more properly now and more and speak more complex now with the words he'll be able to teach Chad better now because at first, Fred had to use hand signals to communicate with um, with Martha, and then afterwards he was able to speak limited sentences to Chad, and now he can speak properly. You know, use complex sentences to explain. You know, to teach Chad in more detail, use a more detailed language. So, I think as Chad got to know him more, as Martha got to trust him more, that's when the language barrier broke. So, him being able to speak more, you know, being able to speak properly now, 
it will certainly help Martha in teaching Fred better. So that's all for now. We're almost at the end of where the VN is at right now. So thank y'all very much for watching. Goodbye.